Hi, everyone. I'm Rick Nelson, AASHTO SciCop coordinator, and welcome to today's webinar showcasing the use of technology in achieving the maintenance mission. For those of you who might not know, SciCop stands for the Snow and Ice Cooperative Program, and we're AASHTO's Winter Maintenance Technical Service Program. SciCop works closely with the Committee on Maintenance and their Maintenance Operations Technical Working Group. Together, we're bringing you this webinar today. For the next 60 minutes or so, two presenters will brief you on their use of technology to address some unique uh, challenges in their maintenance operation. And we hope that they may be useful in your operation too. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you that you're in listen-only mode, and the way to communicate is through the chat pod or the, the questions box. I'd like to remind you that this webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be available at a future date. If questions come to mind uh, for the presenters, please type your questions into the question pod, and we'll answer them uh, as we get through the uh, as we get through the webinar. First on tap today is Brad Dar, who's the state maintenance engineer for the state of North Dakota. Good afternoon, Rick. Can you hear me? Oh yes, you're coming through fine, Brad. Very good. Uh, as Rick mentioned, I'm Brad Dar. I'm the state main maintenance engineer for the state of North Dakota. I'm also the chair of the AASHTO Committee on Maintenance, Maintenance Operations Technical Working Group. Here today to talk to you about North Dakota's experience with uh, section or garage optimization, uh, which includes route optimization. All right, a uh, little background. Uh, over time, the department has reviewed the number of maintenance sections statewide and made consolidations based on efficiencies. Uh, prior to the 60s, the department had 135 sections, which concentrated on gravel road maintenance. Over the years, gravel roads transitioned to pavement and as equipment evolved and the need for larger crew sizes grew, maintenance operations have changed, leading to the consolidation of maintenance sections. The two most recent North Dakota optimization studies were completed in 94 and 2008, uh, with another one completed in uh, 2016, ahead of our last legislative session. Uh, we, the 2016 version took a look at where all of our, did a similar study compared to the other ones on paper, but we also made an attempt to look at where our schools, our healthcare facilities, including ambulance services, trauma centers, and the like were located in the state. So we put our sections in areas that we're able to hire operators. Uh, there was the, in the past studies were developed around staffing and the number of lane miles per operator. The rationale was to increase the staffing and resources in order to provide better snow and ice control. Now with advancements being made in equipment, MDSS, AVL, and others, and the methods of operations, more efficiency can be obtained. Uh, when we've completed that study in 2016, we took that to our legislature, and we were, we were able to close eight sections. Uh, when we did close those eight sections, it came with a number of strings. We could not sell the property. We were to lease those sections to a county and city if they were interested. Uh, we had to, if an employee was still living in that community, they asked us to have the body and truck leave from there during a storm, and they mandated a study. Uh, the study basically, the legislation said that we'll study the manner in which to provide snow and ice control services on the state highway system, including the existing costs for those services, any potential savings, and based on those findings, determine the most efficient and effective manner in which to provide snow and ice control services. And then we had to present that study to our legislative body. Uh, 
as we started thinking of how to get this accomplished, we established a steering committee. Uh, that steering committee uh, included members of the maintenance division, as well as a member from all eight of our districts. Uh, we knew that district input was going to be vital to the success of this project. Uh, in, I'll talk about it further, but we ended up doing three runs and we actually included our district engineers in the second and third run to make sure they were on board with everything that was going on. Uh, we were lucky in that uh, the North Dakota DOT and Kansas DOT are members of the Clear Roads uh, Pooled Fund and we had solicited a project that got accepted through Clear Roads, identifying the best practices for snow and snowplow route optimization. Uh, after seeing the results of that, we actually had the Kentucky do a presentation at our AASHTO Committee on Maintenance. Uh, so we had that information in our hip pocket. Uh, we proceeded with some direct phone calls with Kentucky and Wisconsin to find out their experience and uh, how that would benefit the North Dakota Department of Transportation. Uh, we, we went into uh, deciding that an RFP was the appropriate way to procure a commercial off-the-shelf product to do route or section optimization. Uh, some of our key points in our uh, RFP were that we wanted the services for analyzing the existing routes and full development of optimizing routes by that consultant. We wanted it to be commercial and off-the-shelf software. Uh, we wanted them to provide training to the department after the first run so that we could then make changes ourselves into the future and use this for mowing or whatever other opportunities we feel we would, be would benefit the department in the future. And we asked them to write a final report. Uh, we went through that process. Uh, we awarded to C2 Logics to the tune of about $180,000 um, with some optional items that you can see on the bottom there. Uh, if, they, if they couldn't use our routable network, uh, we wanted them to tell us what routable network they would use and how much that would cost. Uh, but luckily, they were able to use a uh, routable network through our GIS system, saving us that $14,000. Uh, we also had the contingency that if we needed them to run more routes, uh, it would be $16,000 a route. As we were moving forward into this project, we, we thought we knew what the public wanted, but we wanted to validate that. So we went out with a survey, and we were lucky enough to be in the 100th year of the North Dakota Department of Transportation. So we had a transportation expo. We had a booth set up there with computers and blank surveys that the public could take it and mail them back to us. Uh, we also had it out on our website. Uh, we were lucky enough to get like 1,200 uh, surveys back. And we kind of validated what we thought. The drivers are satisfied with our services. Uh, they want the same service on all four-lane roadways, regardless of their classification. They did understand that uh, we're not a 24-7 organization other than in our three urban areas. And they understood and accepted the fact that uh, our start times are at 4 or 5 in the morning to 7 at 10 at night. Uh, the next slide is showing the way we were staffed going into the study, we're still staffed that way until the end of this biennium. We'll find out what our legislature says. But basically, 354 operators, 17,000 lane miles, which equates to about 48 lane miles per operator. And of course, everybody knows uh, we need to plow interchanges, roundabouts, rest areas and way stations, and in addition, in a couple of our districts, we have missile sites to plow to. Uh, also going into this project, we had a level of service stolen from adjacent state, I won't name them, but uh, basically our 
levels of service were just based on a desired recovery time, uh, looking at a four inch event, and then how many hours a day we'd be out there on the highways. Uh, we did preach seamless boundaries between our districts so the public didn't know where one district started and one district stopped. And we attempted to plow compared to our high performance classification system, which is our, our hierarchy of roads, which we do have uh, had presented to our legislature and they had agreed to. Uh, getting the program set up, you need to uh, come up with a number of assumptions. Uh, the big assumptions for getting the results out of the system are your cycle time, your plow speeds, your deadhead speeds, your spreading speeds. Uh, those are key indicators in the program. But in looking at your operation throughout the day, we took a step back and validated with our district, well, how many hours a day are you actually out plowing? Uh, you need to do pre and post trips, you take breaks, you take lunches, uh, you load salt, you unload it at the end of the day. You do, we do road reporting by our operators directly from our operators. And we found out that about three and a half hours out of the day, they're not even truly plowing. Uh, some additional assumptions we made were that a, a plow clears one lane, a tow plow clears two lanes. Uh, we needed to add in delays at interchanges and roundabouts because it's not just a, they're not just plowing through at those plowing speeds. Uh, we we do are we are lucky enough to have four tow plows per district. We allowed the uh, company and the program to tell us where the optimum place for those tow plows were, but we did dictate that they be on four lane roadways. Uh, we also validated that our uh, salt would reach the extent of these routes, and as as well as fuel. Uh, in the end, this is what our levels of service looked like. This is our third run. Uh, we took a run at, we, we adjusted those uh, cycle times twice before uh, finally, finally in on our third and final run. But you can see North Dakota has uh, two interstates, one going east-west, one going north-south, a uh, nice system of interregional roads, the blue ones that are for the most part, four lane roadways. Uh, this is what our cycle times look like when you plot it out on a map. Uh, you, you can see that the interstate uh, districts, nothing really changes. We had uh, our uh, western part of our state's impacted by oil. Our eastern part of the state is more densely populated and has, does have a Based on uh, topology, topography, we have a more a denser network of roadway in our eastern part of our state. Uh, after the vendor completed a run, this is some of the results and how they looked. Basically, it's turn by turn directions with arrows and different colored arrows based on whether it's uh, your service time, whether you're going to or from your section or garage, or whether it's your deadheading. Uh, this is the results uh, when you plot it on a district map, and then we eventually put these on statewide maps too. I should say that, that you put all those inputs in, the the company it, it's an iterative process so they the the program does a lot of the generating but then there's an operator that works from one side of your state to the other making sure all of the turns match up and all the routes are every mile of road is covered here is also some results I didn't mention, but I will now, that their very first run of, of your system is using your existing plow routes. They need something to compare to. So 
what you're seeing on the screen is our existing plow route and the different colors are the service time, deadhead time, to and from the facility time. And you can see in our routes, our existing routes going into this process were not very uniform. We had routes anywhere from an hour up to 10 hours. Uh, then now you can see the final results. This is our premium run or run number three that we are satisfied with. Uh, you can see how it balanced out the time for the routes based on those a lot of times based on our level of service. This is another graphical way of, or chart way of showing the results. Uh, the routes and our trucks are down the left side and then it's showing the breakdown of time instead of a bar chart like on here. So you can see that we didn't have any time in there for transferring anything. We didn't have any, we didn't use U-turn avoidance. That's really something the uh, cities use to avoid left turns. Uh, and our uh, final results of our project were run three showed 28 route reductions or 7.9% showed 23.2% uh, or 314 hour route reduction. It showed 5,871 mile reduction or 19.4%. Uh, as everybody's aware, the, the big savings in route optimization are your trucks and your staffing time. Uh, there will be future savings in not having to replace some facilities. Uh, as we had that data and we decided we, uh, we had to put the, our report together for our legislature and we briefed our uh, director with his prior experience in other states. He asked us to go out and do focus groups. So we had the survey. We also then hired a communication company to go out with no DOT involvement and get the straight and narrow from a selected group of individuals for these focus groups to find out what, what they really believe. And the results were, they also were generally pleased with the DOT performance. They admitted they take the road maintenance for granted and they admitted they don't understand how we operate. They didn't understand how it was funded. They did feel a tax on fuel is acceptable for a funding source. And they validated that our, uh, our hours of service were adequate. Uh, when you take a look at our final run, this, this is a breakdown from our existing routes having 354 operators. Our run one using a maximum of six hours to complete our lower volume roads showed us reducing a staff of 58 employees and trucks. Our run two, we had two hours for our interstates and, and uh, we ended up being down 14 operators. In our run three, we had, we kind of looked back at our existing service and we settled in on three hours of allowable time for a route for our interstate and uh, our interregional system, our four lane roadways and our state highways and our very low volume roads, we ended up with a four hour cycle time. And in our, our third run, we pulled out 11 garages or sections that made sense and we added actually added one section back in that, that helped us eliminate a couple of those sections so we were down 10 sections and the final run showed we could reduce routes by 27. Uh, we needed a way to talk to our legislature on these results and we settled in on how many cycles a day 
would be on each classification of roadway by district. So the bottom line is to the public, how many times is that plow gonna go in front of my house each day or my business? So you can see uh, based on the results, some districts were very similar. We had uh, Grand Forks, interstate routes were very close to what we had existing today. Like Grand Forks 3.4 cycles per day average versus 3.5. Some of our districts that don't have a lot of inter or have no interstate and not that not that many interregional roadways, they're the ones that you can see a significant difference. Their service or cycles per day actually uh, hurt. Like Devil's Lake, they had they used to have 4.1 cycles per day. They're down to 3.2 cycles per day. Now. For our real world results, uh, we started out with 354 routes. We ended up with 27 less or 327 routes. But when you equate that to bodies, we took a hard look at our operation. And the reality of the situation is that on any given storm day and validated with our human resources and tracking our timesheet, 10% of our workforce is gone for the day either out sick or for some other reason so we put plus our districts back up with two operators per district for people being out so we can cover those 327 routes and then when we add in our night shift in our three urban areas we're back to 351 operators versus our 354 so in reality we were uh, staffed pretty close to what we really needed. Uh, the next steps, uh, we'll regroup after our legislative session. In fact, they may be asking us to open five of the eight sections we closed two years ago. We are currently in the process of truthing those routes using AVL and the work we've done to date says that they're very accurate. Those routes make sense and can be done in the time allotted in those assumptions. Uh, I mentioned the five of the eight sections closed, partially reopening. Uh, we went, also hired the vendor who did training for us. So we had an engineer and analyst to do some future work for us. Well, that engineer left the department. So uh, we'll have a job opening shortly. So if anybody wants to move to North Dakota, get involved in route optimization, I uh, will be looking for a Sharp individual. And uh, in talking to others, what what makes this uh, product interesting is it does a very good job, but it's one route and it's a fixed route. What uh, what would what would you say if we had this technology married with a maintenance decision support system, and you could adaptive adapt the routes to the storm? Uh, I think that's the ultimate, and when when that arrives, that tech technology arrives, I think uh, the industry will be better off. And Rick, I'll stand by for any questions. Okay, uh, Brad, it looks like we do have a couple of questions um, from uh, Caleb Dobbins. It appears the average number of cycles dropped to achieve the reduction. Did you run it and force the same number of cycles to see if the manpower savings from general optimization? It appears you optimized and changed uh, level of service simultaneously. We, I, I would say that last statement is correct and we didn't do anything else. We optimized and changed the levels of service because like I'd mentioned before, we really didn't have a level of service we'd published. We had the section is located here and the truck just went out from there regardless of the hierarchy of roadways. So in, in this case, we were focused on meeting the level of service based on that highway performance classification system that we've hung our hat on for years and years, where before, it was just 
where do you leave your section? Take care of your roads. Okay. Uh, second question comes from Clay Adams. How many hours do your operators work in a snow and ice event? Uh, we, it, 14 hours is what we say. So basically in an emergency situation, we allow them to work 14 hours a day. Okay. Uh, here's a question from Peter. I apologize for your uh, last name. Uh, why were the night sections added back into the overall section count? And was this done with the original section counts? This That wasn't done with the original section counts. Uh, it's just uh, before the night shifts were taken out of hide, and now we're acknowledging that those staff are here separate times, and they're really focused on our urban area, the core, interstate area where you're between your storm gates and keeping that open 24 hours a day. And and here's a follow-up question from Peter. Would it not be the same section as the day section? The section is the same, but because North Dakota is not staffed 24 hours a day, overall, we carved out bodies in those three urban areas. Okay, very good. Thank you, Brad, uh, for an excellent presentation. Now for the second half of our webinar, we'll transition to Emily McGraw, who is the uh, state maintenance engineer for the North Carolina DOT. And she's gonna talk about some, some other kinds of severe weather. Good afternoon. Um, again, my name is Emily McGraw. Rick, can you hear me? Oh yes, you're coming through just fine. Okay, and the screen's up? Indeed it is. Okay, fantastic. Well, we may not have the snow that our friends up in North Dakota have, but we do have a lot of storms in our state. And over the past couple of years, we've had some substantial 500 year storms in our state. And we've learned from one of our big storms and have made some applications and some provisions to help us in our recovery, response, and reimbursement process. So let me state, set the stage for you. If you're not familiar with, um, I'm having the same issue Brad did, I think. Rick, okay, there we go. Uh, if you're not familiar, in 2016, in the fall of 2016, Hurricane Matthew came to North Carolina. Uh, we were anticipating a very quick storm we were anticipating wind damage. Unfortunately, that's not what we had. We had a flooding event. And uh, this was the largest flooding event we had had in, ever, in close to 20 years. In some areas of our state, particularly the southeastern part of the state, I hope you can see this area with the pink spots. And our friends in South Carolina had these problems as well. We had close to 18 inches of rain over um, a short amount of time. And previous to this storm, we had had substantial rainstorms as well. So just a lot of flooding in our state. And that resulted in a lot of damage. Uh, we had over 1,700 incidents during, uh, during Hurricane Matthew that was recorded in our um, traveler information system. At one time, we had over 600 roads closed at any one time. Well, when the waters receded and they had to flow eastward towards, towards the ocean, we had identified over 2,000 FEMA route sites and 700 FHWA sites that, uh, with a price tag of over 200 million that we knew we had to do substantial work on. The damage, these are just some example photographs of what we had, shoulder failures, pipe washouts, culverts. We had bridges that we lost during this event as well. So substantial damage across our state. And to be an applicant with these, um, with our federal agencies, you have to provide a lot of information. So we certainly, day one, after the, the water receded, began our federal reimbursement process with both of our federal partners, FEMA as well as FHWA. But as I like to say, you can't just say, we had a lot of damage and we need to be reimbursed. They don't just take us at our word. We have to provide 
a lot of information. And for states that have gone through this, you know what I mean. Everything from damage descriptions, where we have dimensions, we've got to provide a decent scope of work, estimates. Uh, anything that you can imagine really related to that site from equipment logs, timesheets, receipts, purchase orders, the contracts, making sure provision, uh, federal provisions are in those contracts, all of that has to be supplied for the financial reimbursement process. Well, during Hurricane Matthew, we utilize the tools that we utilize during Hurricane Matthew for the most part were spreadsheets and cameras and GPS devices. And we ultimately would take all that information and load it into our financial system to supply information to our federal partners. And having 2,700 sites makes you think there has to be a better way of doing this. So um, at that time, we had hired a new disaster recovery engineer. His name is Josh Kellen, sitting in here with me. So if we get tough questions, he's going to help me with them. Uh, he started looking at different software applications, and uh, what we identified, what he identified, was an application called Survey123. And I just want to throw it out there that we're in Esri State. Uh, we utilize Esri for our GIS needs, and Survey123 is part of the suite of Esri products. And so Josh identified this particular application as potentially being helpful for us. And so what we identified was we needed a tool that we could use to help us capture all of the information needed from the first visit when doing preliminary damage assessments. We wanted the ability to geolocate. We wanted the ability to work offline. And we also wanted the ability to store pictures. So taking all of this information that's how we settled on this particular product. And we did, uh, named our specific application assist, which is application for site-specific information storage and tracking. Now, I've got a few screenshots. I'm just going to walk you through it. And, and I, it's kind of simple. All this is is an online form that you can use on a tablet, a phone, any kind of device in the field. And what this does, this online form basically prompts an inspector to put in information that we need. And the forms were designed with the end in mind of financial reimbursement. And so things like the first thing you need to know is when, when are you doing the inspection? Who's doing the inspection? Um, assigning it a site number, where is this? So uh, the, the inspector is prompted with specific information that he or she has to populate when he is doing that preliminary damage assessment. Um, whether or not they know, uh, if it's a FEMA route or an FHWA route, that's certainly important to us in our state. And then it just continues to prompt. You know, if you identify the type of damage that the site is, more specific information is requested. And this particular, um, th this particular one, which you see we've uh, selected, that it's a pipe culvert. So we have to provide, or the inspector would have to provide the diameter and the length, the number of barrels. Uh, and again, additional information uh, that would be needed for us to have in the financial recovery process. So um, we found this tool to be very helpful during Hurricane Florence. And one more thing I want to show you is that we uh, developed a, a user's guide that we posted on our website that folks would be able to utilize and download. We wanted this to be a, a simple application that anyone really could pick up and use. Um, just for, for y'all's awareness, two engineers on my team built this system uh, with some support from our GIS and IT section. Uh, they developed this user's guide, which we put on our website, and we were ready with this application in the spring of 2018, which proved to be very helpful. These are just some other screenshots that are in our training manual. Because in September, uh, Hurricane Florence came, and while we had not utilized this application to this point yet, uh, we certainly found the need to use it for this event. Hurricane Florence came through in September of this past year. You can see in the uh, 
southeastern part of our state, we had over 35 inches of rain. This was an event that affected pretty much the majority of our state. Again, substantial flooding, 500, in some places, 500 year flood, in some cases, a thousand year flood. So again, substantial damage in our state. Uh, we had over 2,500 incidents recorded in our traveler information management system. We identified it over close to 2,700 FEMA route sites, over 850 FHWA route sites with a price tag of over 200 million. And for the record, we are still collecting debris from this event. We, uh, 421, uh, that large picture in the center of the screen, that's a breach of US 421 near the Wilmington area. I-40 was underwater uh, heading towards Wilmington as well. We had similar damage as what we saw from Hurricane Matthew. Shoulder washouts, pipe washouts, culverts, bridges. And so as the waters receded, um, just like we did with Hurricane Matthew, we began doing our preliminary damage assessments. And I wanna just make this note that while we had developed this application and hadn't had a chance to really test it on a small storm, we decided to go ahead and deploy it for Hurricane Florence. Uh, we conducted three webinars to train personnel on how to use it. Uh, we trained consultants that were partnering with us as well, and we had that online user's guide. And so I just wanna show you a few pictures of um, proof that it was utilized. So um, as the waters receded, our field forces began doing their preliminary damage assessments. So on September 15th, the little dots that you see are our identified sites, sites that we had damaged. And I'm just gonna run through a few dates. You can see that, um, again, waters receding, more people are getting out and doing their damage assessments. And as time passes, we had close to 3,500 dots on our state from identified places of damage. Now, just having dots on a page isn't hugely helpful, but where it is helpful is it provided us real-time information on where our damage was across our state. Um, we had a snapshot as the user was putting in information, we had access to that information. Unlike the past, where we were relying on individuals to do their site inspections and record the information and ultimately load it into our financial recovery system, typically that took weeks. We were able to get this information honestly while the waters were still receding. This is a screenshot of, for, um, for you of um, what the state looked like um, soon after the event and the preliminary damage assessment was completed. Again, close to 3,500 sites were identified at that time. While um, Josh and I were sitting in emergency management, he identified that you could build dashboards with this particular software. So we quickly began building dashboards when we saw that um, this picture of our state with all the dots on it was showing up on the news. So this provided information very quickly on you know, how many sites were FHWA, how many sites were on the FEMA system. We were able to separate out you know, how many sites by our division or district in some of your areas, and certainly the types of damage as well. Just a way to, to tell the story of what our damage was in our state at the time. We found this hugely helpful. The other great thing about this tool is you can, because all the data is in there and it is geo-referenced and it's on a map, you can look at what you want to, whether you want to look at the entire state as what I just showed you, or if you want to look at a division. This is a picture of the, the damage sites in division three for us, that's southeastern North Carolina. And so we could just look at that particular area. If a representative was interested in a district or a senator wanting to know just the damage in their area, we could provide that information. We could take this information down to the county level. Um, this is New Han Hanover County, one of our coastal counties that had 178 sites identified with damage. So just a powerful tool that has all the information in one spot. 
Also, um, in addition to getting the information in, we're able to report out of this particular application. And again, I mentioned before that we began with the end in mind. This, has, uh, uh, this is a sample of a site detail report that has all the information that we would need to provide for the beginning stages of our financial recovery. And photos, I failed to mention this, photos are easily, um, as the inspector is filling out the form, putting in all the information with that device, that phone or tablet, he can take a picture of the damage and it's automatically uploaded and associated with that dot with all of that information tied to that particular geo-referenced location. Now I show this picture because we did have some hiccups along the way. If you can see right here, we did not have a damage site in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. You know, we learned some things along the way. That happens when um, we identified that we had a user who didn't have their, G, their GIS turned on correctly. There are just some technology glitches that happen that we had to work through. It wasn't seamless, but we, we learned and, um, and were able to get some corrections made, certainly before this map was, was publicized. So how useful did we find it? Well, from our field personnel, we, we heard a lot of positive feedback from our field personnel. They liked it because they were able to make single trips to uh, the site for their preliminary damage assessment. In reality, with a storm of the magnitude of size that we had, while we had very trained personnel, there were individuals that were doing damage assessments that maybe hadn't had a huge history of doing that before. So the, inf the, the application was able to prompt the inspector to put in all the information that would be needed for the preliminary assessment. And then what we also found was having all this information georeferenced, having it on a map, and um, segregated by the type of damage, it led to our work plans, how to you know, take all this information and devise ways of um, developing contracts to, to get these routes back open again. The other thing that it did for us is it really standardized data collection across our state, not just with our state forces, but with our CEI inspectors, our private engineering firms. It made everyone to report the data in the same way. Our management and executive team uh, liked it. They were able to have real-time information. Uh, they had eyes on the ground, eyes in the field. Um, they were able to see what our boots on the ground were able to put in at that given time. And they also liked the reporting capability. Again, we were able to push a lot of information a lot earlier on uh, it, from in Hurricane Florence. Uh, our federal partners, FEMA and FHWA, were willing to make declarations based on the preliminary data that they saw. Again, uh, typically, when we're doing our financial recovery, we're using our accounting system, which is SAP in our state, to provide that information. When our federal partners saw the data that we had geo-referenced and geolocated and the quantity of information, they were willing to work with us. Um, they also liked how uh, the data was um, searchable, how we could list out the different types of damages. And it helped our partners with minimizing the number of field inspections that they needed to go through and do. And again, consolidating the data into one data set really simplifies it for our submissions with our federal partners. Now, moving forward, um, we're certainly hoping that we don't have another 500 or 1,000 year event anytime soon in our state, but we're gonna continue refining the tool. There are things that we, we learned from deploying this tool with Hurricane uh, Florence that we need to refine and make further modifications for f future use. Uh, we do need to do more field training. Uh, while it was a simple application and people were able to pick it up and use it, we certainly do want to make sure our field personnel as well as our consultant partners are comfortable with utilizing this application. Also, what we would like to do is to tie this into our financial system in some way. Currently, these systems do not talk, but we do 
see the opportunity that there could be a, a much simpler way to upload this information into our financial system. So we're looking to, to see what we can do there. And then we're looking at ways to automate some of uh, to automate some of the work. Um, if we have the measurements and we have the locations, there are some things that we can automate in terms of defining damage descriptions with the scope of work, as well as automating an engineer's estimate. So we're looking at at doing that kind of math in the tool as well. And we're looking at additional uses, other ways that we can utilize the Survey123 application for other data acquisition within our state. So with that, Rick, I'm, I'm finished at this point. I'll be happy to take any questions. So Todd is asking, uh, it looks like you used uh, drones for your assessments. How extensive was your use? We did use drones um, during the um, during the event for Hurricane Florence. We did not during Hurricane Matthew. We utilized them for eyes on the ground. Uh, we are not using them for calculate. We we don't have any drone footage in our. We did not upload drone footage into Survey One Two Three, but we did utilize it for looking at the damage that we had across our state. Okay. It looks like that's uh, the extent of our questions. I would like to uh, to say I, I hope you uh, enjoyed this webinar and found the information from uh, North Dakota and North Carolina interesting and, and hopefully useful. Uh, I also would like to remind you that the Committee on Maintenance annual meeting is scheduled for July 15th through 18th. And uh, at that meeting, we're partnering with the Transportation Research Board uh, to bring you the best of TRB to this, uh, to this meeting. On behalf of the Committee of Maintenance, Maintenance Operations, TWIG, and SICOP, thank you for your attention. Uh, that concludes today's State Showcase webinar.